How could they be other than legend? Stories told from deep within the mind of Earth. Myth made flesh. Here is the wind and thunder, the soul of wildness. Life force hurled from the quiet heart of time. Wild horses, nature at her most eloquent. They speak of our most cherished longing. They speak of freedom. Just to know they are in our world is to know that in this ever more confining age, we too can be free. A wild horse is a horse that roams freely around its own home territory within a social hierarchy, adapting to its environment over time. They represent freedom, and that's a desire we all have, to go where we want to go and be what we want to be. America's Mustangs are that kind of horse. When you see a creature that can adapt better than humans, that can make use of its habitat and can still reproduce and still be wild and free, it, it tugs at us. We're not that wild and free. I think that in order to have a truly biodiverse society, we need to have everything. And two things you look at, the biodiversity of the environment and the health of the plants and the health of everything within that environment. And that's what makes a healthy society. It's told to me that the horses have always existed in our country. One reason that they were able to survive over long periods of time because they adapted to the human conqueror and the human conquered them, so to speak. Horses, generally in every culture, are connected to the soul of all people because almost every culture either used a burrow or a horse in its civilization. So I believe that there is a deep connectedness between humankind and between horses. It would have been a lot more difficult to accomplish things in, in America uh, without the horse. Probably one reason that we as Americans don't eat them, because we look at them as a companion and a partner with us. I worry if we become separated from nature and our children no longer are out here on this grass and looking at the trees and participating with nature, that they'll forget our roots and that everything that was so important to humankind in the early time may not be as important in the future generations. Highly intuitive, intelligent, discerning, elusive, playful, and magnificently strong and fast. Wild horses are often called dolphins of the land. Their deep devotion to their bands of family and friends is what they live for and what has helped them survive. But humans continue to interfere in their time-tested social hierarchy and free-roaming life on the range. The world has millions of horses, but America's Mustangs are now facing extermination in the wild. <laughs> As an animal of prey, their lives are always at risk, with humans posing their greatest threat. What the Bureau of Land Management innocuously refers to as gathers is a brutal, hell-bent helicopter drive that terrifies these sensitive animals of prey. They run for their lives in a heart swell of panic as sweat pours from their withers, fluid and blood ooze from their noses, hooves tear and wear down, legs break, flesh is torn and dust fills their lungs. Weakened by dehydration, fear and exhaustion overwhelm them as they are chased forever from their free roaming lives on the range. We carry a burden for these horses because they belong to all of us. Public horses on public land, removed callously with millions of dollars of our tax money. 
Isn't there a terrible wrong being done here to both human and horse? We will be ramping up the number of gathers the next three years. This first gather I've been to, uh, we have most of the horses of the 37,000 and burrows of raw and public range lands live in Nevada. So this is the place to see them. When they come into the trap, we get um, the stud horses, mares, colts, and everything, and they can't be shipped together. This gather is a helicopter drive gate cut, and so we're not selecting horses for removal or selecting horses to be released. They're in good flesh, they're in good condition. The 1971 Wild Horse and Burrow Protection Act states, it is the policy of Congress that wild, free-roaming horses and burros shall be protected from capture, branding, harassment, or death. And to accomplish this, they are to be considered in the area where presently found roaming as an integral part of the natural system of the public lands. We have many other laws that pertain to us, including the 1971 Wild Free-Roaming Horses and Burros Act. The law passed in 1971, there were 303 herd areas in the United States in 10 western states where wild horses and burros were recognized. In a checkerboard of barbed wire fences, over 20 million acres of public land has been reallocated for other uses. The BLM has eliminated nearly 40% of the original areas designated for free roaming wild horses. And since 1971, an estimated 200,000 horses and burros have been removed from approximately 50 million acres of public land. Bottom line of the law is that we're to protect, manage, and control the herd population. They were extremely skittish, and they were turning, fighting the helicopter, and they would not come in. Maybe these horses haven't been gathered, but everything around them, and, and they, don't, they don't stay at home. In a desolate western landscape, Mustangs often have to travel over 20 miles in a day for a drink, only to have their water source fenced off or fouled by privately owned livestock. If a Bureau of Land Management or U.S. Forest Service Mustang crosses the boundary between public to private land, they are automatically considered trespassers and are most often captured and shipped for slaughter. Do we actually expect them to read the boundary signs? Herd management areas are administrative creations that we did. These are areas where we have determined uh, through previous land use planning efforts that we can manage a certain number of horses and burrs in those areas. Over time that can change though and we may have to either consolidate or reduce, zero out a herd management area. The horses have a, effectively a roaming range of 34 million acres. We don't manage exclusively for horses and burros any more than we do for cattle. Ranchers pay a dollar thirty-five per cow. And that is neat. You can't even afford to feed a mouse today for a dollar thirty-five. This price is for an animal unit consisting of a cow and a calf grazing for one month on the range. During this time, the pair will consume about a ton of forage. Additionally, cattlemen receive federal subsidies which make the real grazing cost per two cows approximately 60 cents per month. The same grazing costs on private land run an average of 15 to 22 dollars a month. Consequently, 8 to 12 million mostly corporate cattle are dumped on subsidized public land in early spring before delicate spring forage has taken firm root. They are left by absentee cattlemen to degrade resources on the range until late fall when they are picked up in semi-loads headed for feedlots. According to Western Watersheds Project, it costs the American government more to run the cattle grazing program than they make from it. Yet those who lobby for the permanent removal of the Mustangs claim they have no economic value in the wild and refer to the Mustangs as the scourge of the West. Is it any surprise that this all comes down to money?
This mayor is one of many who never recover. Now prisoners, their free spirits broken, and family and friendship bonds forever severed, they become like ghosts in a culture who doesn't care to understand them. To paraphrase Chief Seattle, what we do to the wild horses, we also do to ourselves. There's not a horse out there on the range that doesn't think it's a wild horse. There's no dom dom domestic characteristics in those horses. They're born in the, in the wild, they believe they're wild, they behave like a wild. Those horses are standing around a government holding pen someplace or a, a small ranch and uh, beset by flies and boredom. And, and uh, I've looked in the eyes of those horses and I don't like what I see. There's a sadness there that just breaks my heart. It gets back to the basic problem. The Bureau of Land Management was a land management agency. They are not a horse management agency. So when all the priorities on the checklist are gone over, wildlife, water, range, forage, everything on the list, the last on the list is horses. And if there's not enough of anything, the horses are going to go. That is the justification for horse removal, to say the habitat can't support them. I think the government from now on is going to have a difficult time getting more money uh, for wild horses when there's so many other causes competing. So it's time, the time to come up with a solution that's practical and efficient and good for the horses. The time is right now. Under the direction of the Department of the Interior, the Bureau of Land Management is a multiple-use agency. Multi-use means that special interest groups vie for cheap land use permits for oil and gas, livestock grazing, mining, hunting, development and recreational uses. For hundreds of years, ranchers have rid the land of natural predators. Now more than ever, everybody fights over water, the lifeblood of the West. Such self-serving interests have long jeopardized a balanced ecosystem and put all of nature at risk. Before the uh, Wild Horse and Burrow Protection Act that was passed in 1971, horses were being managed willy-nilly by anybody who liked them or disliked them. There were horse traders that were breeding them, there were ranchers that were shooting them. What started the humane groups that Wild Horse Annie started, which is the International Society for the Protection of Mustangs and Burrows, that really drove the act was the fact that there were ranchers dragging horses behind trucks. Just horrible treatment. Congress passed the act as a reaction to the public. It was a huge outcry, the largest since the, the Vietnam War. The Bureau of Land Management kind of got stuck with the stick. They were mostly ranchers in communities with cousins and fathers and friends. And suddenly, the government that's there to manage range land for the ranchers is now suddenly being told to protect a species that up to that point they'd been getting rid of. The BLM had to adapt itself to suddenly take on something that they really were not interested in taking on because Congress directed them to do it. In this era, in any given year, there are an estimated 12 million cattle compared to under 30,000 horses on the range. Cows degrade riparian areas because they tend to camp at them and they consume 30 times more grass than the Mustangs. Wild horses take turn at watering holes twice a day, then mosey along browsing on a wide range of forage. In every other species, we study the species to look at parameters and we look at factors that allow that species to be adaptable to their habitat in a positive way, except with horses. There are no horse biologists out there studying horses to see, oh, look, when those two are together, they seem to take the herd over there at 2 o'clock and they don't seem to have a lot of digging up the water hole. Wild horses have almost no one officially studying them. What all wildlife needs from us is stewardship that comes from understanding and time taken to observe and document them in nature without interfering. The horse never had a, a designation. It was not designated wildlife because you couldn't shoot it. It wasn't really designated as an endemic species because everybody believed the Spanish brought it in and there was some history of ranchers breeding horses. So it really lost its status and we lost focus that the horse was, was born in North America. It was native to North America. Through DNA testing now, the same horse that disappeared on this continent during the Ice Age is the same horse that came back. 
The evidence based on molecular biology is overwhelming that the same horse that left this continent is the same horse that returned. 7,000 years ago or so, they'd, by then they'd gone across the land bridges to other countries, to England and, and uh, to Mongolia. Uh, and they all died out here for some reason, uh, but they came back in Columbus's second voyage. And well, that doesn't mean they aren't, weren't indigenous here. So there's certainly fossil remains, lots of fossil remains of horses. Among many other artifacts, Clovis points have been found, together with bones of human, mammoth, camel, and horse DNA samples, matching that of today's modern horse. Still, outdated science and myths prevail. The old guard wants people to believe that the primitive horse was genetically different from the modern horse. But different features, size, shape, or color don't necessarily mean different DNA. This is a very clear case in point where belief systems are driving the management of a species, not the biology, not the science. What we have is a crossover. We have a crossover hybrid. We have a hybrid between humans intervening and breeding horses for specific purposes and wild genetics retaining the wild species. Settlers of the West freely took wild horses from their life on the range. They bred them with larger ranch stock and used them to wrangle cattle, buck in rodeos, pull plows or wagons, or become their prized horse. That is, until they didn't need them any longer. Then, they either abandoned them on the range or sold them for slaughter. Is it a wonder that wild horses get the blame for human interference and are so easily accused of being feral, trespassers, invasive, and non-native livestock? Throughout time, Horses' hooves have been turned into glue and soap, their hair into blankets, rugs, brushes, and brooms, their hide into shoes and jackets, and their meat ground for pet food. Now, some horse slaughter advocates suggest we feed horse meat to school children, military personnel, and prison inmates, as well as amping up the horse meat shipment as a delicacy dish in parts of Europe and Asia. The horse does not fit into anybody's basket. The wildlife people and, and I've been accosted as a wildlife biologist many times because I consider the horse wildlife species. But wildlife people particularly don't like wild horses. They think of them as feral horses like cattle. Some progress is being made as environmental groups and individuals successfully buy up grazing permits and water rights as a measure to conserve land and resources for all wildlife, including free roaming horses. Instead of spending millions of dollars on helicopter roundups and long-term holding, why not employ people and offer grants to study wild horse behavior and rangeland ecology? Each area's resources and wildlife have unique needs. As private and public partnerships are developed, advocates help with fertility control, documentation of wild horse behavior, and field work to revitalize resources in the increasingly non-productive regions we have fenced the horses into. Rescues, sanctuaries, and adoption programs are offering homes for horses on large parcels of land so they remain free roaming, while some more willing horses are saddle trained. A horse lives to me pretty much moment by moment. They don't have any set goals on, on um, earning enough money to buy a new truck or a house. Uh, it's moment by moment with them. I believe a horse can be happy out in the wild, never seen any human. I believe a horse can be happy with humans. Very few horses I've ever seen do not like to be around humans. Most of these horses, they're more than happy uh, being with a human. You just have to prove yourself that you're a strong leader and that you're a good companion to be with, and the trust factor will build there. I hope that the American Mustang will be preserved to the point of that there will always be some uh, running wild, and for those that you know, are taken off that can, you know, find homes that people do want them. There's stables all over a country. You don't have to necessarily have a, a thousand acres to adopt one of these horses. Um, if you're using them and you're spending time with them, they'll love to spend the time with you. But even in good economic times, Mustang adoptions cannot keep up with the number rounded up each year, with close to 40,000 wild horses and burros languishing in captivity. Many horse dealers push for mass euthanasia or slaughter. Throughout history, 
America's Mustangs have suffered great peril and hardship because of us. What does it say about us as a nation if we can't respect and protect this iconic symbol of America's freedom? A kill buyer goes to a livestock auction with two things in mind. How cheap can he buy a fleshy horse? And how much will he be able to sell it for at slaughter? When I'm at the kill lots, the hardest thing for me is looking at hundreds of horses and figuring out what six will fit on my trailer that day that I can take. And I've had good success with taking pregnant mares, foals, and their um, moms and get the, getting them rehomed and trained. There's something about a mare with a foal at her side. They're willing to go and get on your trailer and save themselves and their babies. In this country, uh, with all the pony club and everything else, these horses are so valuable. And, you know, jumping fences is so easy for them. They grow up uh, staying alive by running as fast as they can down through the sagebrush and the rocks and and everything. And so jumping fences, they think, is the most fun thing in the world. Up until three and a half years ago, I would have never considered a Mustang. And then once we got one, it was like we found this wonderful hidden gem. She's like um, a sister. She loves her peppermint. <laughs> she doesn't like carrots or apples, but she loves peppermints. The best thing about a Mustang is probably their heart. They got, they got a lot of heart. Give it up, give it up, give it up. A lot of the, the adoption program, a lot of those horses have worked out and done a wonderful job for people. But there have been a lot of them who people were afraid of them for one reason or another or the horses didn't work out. She was at a rescue in Conifer, Colorado, along with Topaz, and I fell in love with the two mares. Nobody really seemed to want to be bothered with Mustangs. Uh, they weren't treated the same as the other domesticated horses, so I took them on as my project and got them horse broken. <laughs> That's Bad Boy Bandit. That's why he has that name. Bad Boy Bandit faced the world for the first time the day his starving mother was rescued. Now he brings a piece of paradise into the world. But Bandit is one of the lucky few. Out on the range, another band of Mustangs gallops beneath the spin of the chopper. We see the stallion start to turn. His instincts tell him to run back to the range. We call him Braveheart, because in an instant, the valiant stallion chooses his family instead of his own freedom. Now cornered with his mare and foal, he frantically searches for an escape route. When a hired hand thoughtlessly ties his horse right under the stallion's nose, Braveheart slams against the iron bars. With a forcefulness so great, he breaks his neck. Unable to get up, he is mare and full watch as he thrashes on the ground. They watch as he dies at their feet. Her stallion dead and her terrified foal ripped from her. The dazed mare, crammed into a trailer, watches them shove Braveheart's lifeless body inside. The helicopter lifts off in search of new prey. At BLM's bounty of $250 per head, every minute counts. The now orphaned foal spins in circles, her life like a speck of dust in cruel and calloused winds of change. By law, ecological right and destiny, Mustangs deserve to be part of the tonic of wilderness and freedom that we revere. Solutions for their preservation must come from our compassionate hearts and our informed and educated actions. Ensuring space for them in the wild beckons us to be guardians of the natural world, one of the highest callings for humanity. For in their lives is a reflection of our shared destiny.
For more information or to purchase a DVD of this show, go to www.wildhorsesandwindsofchange.com, a film by Skydancer Productions.